Linux. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, being here and thank you for uh, this introduction. Uh, so as um, he said, I will going to present Kunai. So I hope uh, will be your new threat hunting tool uh, for uh, Linux. So I will just uh, briefly introduce myself before going further. So uh, my name is uh, Quentin. Yes, I have to point this one. Um, and my uh, job is uh, mainly being a freelance security consultant slash researcher here in Luxembourg for my own company, which is called Rosec, as you can see on the slides. Uh, my background is more um, on uh, incident response and all the connected areas, so digital forensics, uh, malware analysis, and so on. And uh, now I'm more focusing on developing open source projects in several languages. Uh, basically, I try to uh, almost publish everything I do open source. So it represents maybe 99% yeah, of my work. And you can find all this on my uh, on my GitHub. I tend to also um, speak to local conferences only. I don't know why, but I'm happy of being here. So. Um, now, a bit of context. Uh, I will tell you in few slides the story behind um, this idea of creating a new monitoring tool for Linux. So why this project? Uh, because I told you so last year. Yeah, this was me last year at the CTI Summit, and at this moment I clearly said that I wanted to investigate like the monitoring possibilities on Windows. Uh, are you convinced of this uh, explanation? Not really. Um, so as many other uh, start of uh, my projects, it all came from a frustration I had. So I really like Sysmon on Windows, and um, I really waited a long time uh, before the Linux version. But at the same time, I was pretty uh, disappointed about it. Why? I will explain you this. Uh, these are my personal opinions, so I will not try to convince you. So yes, Microsoft, I don't know why they will really like to use XML, so both for the configuration of the tool, but also they actually generate the monitoring event uh, themselves in XML, which, to be honest, I don't like. Um, next point is that it's also developed in C++. To be honest, I don't think it's a very good language if you want people to collaborate on uh, such a project, which is open source, of course. Um, I guess they had good reason for this because they probably, uh, it's, it's probably because they developed the Sysmon version for Windows in C++ as well, so they wanted to reuse part of the code. Um, and next point is very important to me as well, is that they, I think they wanted to um, create exactly the same events that they had on Windows, but on Linux. And I don't find a good explanation for that because we have to, um, to be conscious that there are two different OS. So, I mean, it's a bit weird of uh, having the same events for two different uh, OS. Even, yeah, some parts of existing events don't really make sense in the Linux world. And finally, the last point, it's um, that the GitHub activity was pretty uh, down uh, across a year almost. Uh, and I guess, uh, I suppose that it's because the main developer left basically Microsoft just after he did the, the, the first release of that, uh, of that project, of that project. So yeah, I didn't feel this was a good sign, um, for this uh, project. It's not the case anymore because now, uh, it's, uh, it starts, uh, uh, reviving still, uh, uh since April. Uh, but yeah, at that moment in time, I was not convinced it was a good for uh, the project. So yeah, we are end of 2022. Um, and um, this was my state of mind. So just 
um, yeah, why not implementing my own uh, concept of what I think um, Sysmon for Linux should be? And when I say that, I always have people telling me, but you know, there are other projects. And yeah, I'm sorry, but yeah, I'm usually in this state of mind <laughs> because I like to learn and I think it's a great way to learn uh, developing your own projects. And these were my objectives at that moment. So uh, first, uh, take the good ideas behind Sysmon because of course they are good ideas, not only bad. Um, provide relevant events for uh, threat hunting and threat uh, detection, so which means not too raw, like syscall information. For me, it needs a bit uh, more refinement and not too refined because when they are too refined, you get some events, but you don't really understand why they get generated. So we have to find a good balance between uh, those two. Uh, I want something simple, documented, because I think also um, this uh, Microsoft uh, Sysmon sometimes lacks a bit of uh, documentation and you need to experiment a lot, a lot of try and, uh, trial and error, and that what I don't want to do. And yeah, so to fulfill those objectives, uh, I need to answer some questions. So how to do it and in which language? So let's try to answer those questions. So basically in Linux, you have two, maybe more possibilities to develop um, kernel components. So the first one is to uh, develop a kernel module but uh, after a bit of research, it, is sounds, it seems to be a bit out of date uh, and not recommended anymore uh, because uh, the Linux kernel developers are putting a lot of effort into developing this uh, eBPF technology, uh, which allow you uh, basically to run some bytecode inside the VM on kernel side. And this is exactly meant uh, for uh, that purpose. I will explain a bit more into detail what a BPF is uh, in, a, in another slide. So next, uh, which language uh, to use? Knowing that we will have to implement both code in user land and code in kernel land because you will, uh, yeah, in kernel land you cannot do everything. And basically all the application will, will need to be implemented in user land. So the first language on the list is C. And with C you can do everything and you can unleash all the full power of eBPF because kernel is written in C and all the libraries are in C as well. But for the user land part, I think and uh, that it's pretty complicated to write um, a proper application for the known uh, reasons, which are security, the, sometimes the lack of libraries. And to be honest, that's very, very hard uh, to build a solid application uh, in C and requires a lot of experience that I don't have. Uh, C++, to be honest, is probably the same power as C, but uh, I, yeah, it's a bit worse to write, in my opinion. And finally, uh, we have more modern languages, which are Rust, uh, which has nice libraries allowing you to actually write both your uh, eBPF code and uh, user land code. And finally, there is Go. And uh, I wanted to investigate that one because I'm very familiar with Go. And I looked at the Cilium project, but what they do is uh, that they write the probes, their eBPF programs inside uh, in another language. So it means that you actually need to uh, juggle between two languages, one for the application side and one for the kernel side, which I didn't want to do. So uh, I took my decision, uh, let's uh, write this project in Rust. But I have other issue now is uh, I don't know how to write a line of Rust. Uh, I don't know what uh, eBPF is and uh, Linux kernel, uh, yeah, I don't know more. So we have a pretty nice roadmap. So first learn Rust, uh, learn about eBPF and for the kernel, of course, it's very complex. You cannot know everything. 
just learn, learn it on the field. A brief interlude um, to explain you how eBPF works. So first, uh, as I explained previously, you need a programming language that gets compiled down into uh, eBPF bytecode. Then uh, this eBPF bytecode uh, is in user land and needs to be loaded inside the kernel via uh, syscall. And it doesn't get loaded directly inside the, the kernel. It passes through a, um, a block, which is called a verifier, and that actually does uh, a lot of side effects checking. So it checks the number of instructions of your program so that uh, you don't end up with endless loop and you don't cause performance issues. Uh, it checks for uh, kernel read, kernel writes operation. It checks for null pointers. Basically, it checks for all the kind of issue you can have when you write a kernel module. Um, then, uh, this program can be attached to different places uh, in the kernel. You can attach it to syscalls. You can attach it to kernel function, random kernel function, even at random offsets. Um, you can attach it to socket, to network interface. Basically, you can attach it at a lot of places inside the kernel. It's very powerful. And then, once this is done, uh, these instructions are uh, executed inside the VM, inside the kernel, of course, which is the BPF uh, VM. Um, so it means that you in theory, cannot execute uh, arbitrary code if there is no vulnerability in that VM, of course. And uh, finally, to communicate with your user land application, you use a shared memory between the kernel and the user land. And these are called maps in the language of eBPF. And the, those can be of several kinds uh, of data structures. They can be arrays, they can be hash map, they can be uh, bloom filters, and yeah, those are very, very powerful. So uh, if this slide was too technical, uh, this is like a more simple explanation. So basically, all the noob developers are happy because they can write whatever code they want, they will not break the kernel. And all the geeks are happy because there is no more kernel panic because of uh, crappy code. I wait for the picture. <laughs> so now seven months have passed. Uh, this is time for the first release. Um, and uh, with uh, my objective uh, almost fulfilled. So I took all the good, I judged good in Sysman. So uh, all this uh, UID uh, tagging on events that allows a that allows you to track the activity of a given process uh, from its birth until uh, its termination. Also, all the information about file being executed, a file being mapped uh, in memory, uh, more especially the shared objects. And even more, um, we have events in JSON. Uh, we can access the task ancestors, uh, which allows uh, pretty nice uh, detection primitives, um, script execution, but also uh, BPF and eBPF program being loaded inside the kernel, and also some uh, network uh, events are going to be generated, uh, uh, including some doing analysis on the on the data being sent so what makes uh, this tool this tool special compared to uh, the others um, it's not obvious in all the tool but uh, this one uh, offers um, events in a sorted order in chronological order it's not always the case. I don't know if you have played already with Sysmon on Windows, but sometimes you can have weird issues like events uh, arriving after others, uh, while they are, of course, generated in theory before. 
Um, and there is also a feature which is uh, depending on the first one uh, that allows on host correlation. So getting information from previous events uh, to enrich uh, next events, uh, basically. And uh, finally, it can also uh, monitor uh, and have exactly the same behavior as it has on the on the host. Uh, have this information inside the container you are uh, running on your uh, machine. Documentation and support wise, which is not the case for all the projects as well, I try to uh, make a nice documentation that I will try to maintain. Uh, there is also a chat on which I'm uh, always replying, and you can uh, submit your IDs, your issues, and we can basically share uh, knowledge about the tool and uh, Linux threat detection. And yeah, I'm really eager to develop new features, so yeah, you can just open issues on GitHub or ping me on the chat. I will be happy to answer. Um, brief explanation on um, what is on host correlation. So let's take the example of the curl command. So this is a curl command being issued. Uh, and this is um, first when you do a, a curl command on uh, an HTTP and on a host name, on a domain, the DNS resolution needs to happen. So the tool would generate a DNS query event, uh, giving you information about uh, the DNS response, so which is a C name in this case, uh, the IP of the DNS server. And then the tool would also uh, generate a bit after a connect event. The connect happen when uh, curl actually wants to retrieve the page uh, it wants to display. And this happens through the connect syscall. But I don't know if you are familiar with the connect syscall on Linux, but you don't get the information of the domain. And it's a very interesting information to have in terms of uh, uh, security monitoring. So thanks to the, uh, the sorted uh, arrival of the event, we can build uh, on host correlation and basically enrich this event with the host name corresponding to the IP being uh, connected to. Uh, container monitoring. So this was a bit tricky. Uh, some of the expert uh, in terms of container would tell me that, yeah, it's not a big deal because they are just regular Linux tasks. It's just uh, running inside an, an, a namespace. I do agree, but uh, it's another issue when it comes down to hashing files, because you need to navigate inside this container somehow from the outside, because Kuna is running on the system, not inside the container, and you need to uh, fetch the information uh, of the file. So yeah, it's a bit uh, tricky to do. And uh, for instance, this is an example of um, of a shared object being loaded by the curl command I just showed earlier. And this library actually exists only inside the container, the Bionic container, and doesn't exist on the host system. So that's that's basically a trick and uh, the, the container monitoring of the tool. Um, I will not go further into uh, the events um, of the of the tool. You can find them all uh, on the website uh, with uh, explanation about them. And I will focus now on the challenges I faced during this uh, this project. Uh, so the first one was learning Rust. Uh, was not very easy because it has like some concepts uh, that are not. Um, in the other languages I knew. Um, then I had uh, issues uh, of when writing eBPF programs in Rust. I initially used a library called Red BPF. And when I was about at 80% of my project, I had to make a choice because I was limited by this project. And I decided to switch to another uh, library, which is called Aya. And this task to, took me like uh, one and a half uh, months. 
to be honest, I think I did a good choice of switching because this library is now uh, archived on GitHub and it's not maintained anymore. So yeah, it had to be done. Uh, next point uh, is that I wanted to use um, not yet officially supported features uh, from AYA, uh, which is BPF Core. BPF Core allow uh, to have a single executable you can run on all the kernels. And for this, I had to contribute and work a lot with the AYA guys. So my contribution didn't end up in a lot of code being written, but I can tell you that I really spent a lot of time in uh, reading code, bug tracking, reporting in all these uh, projects. So uh, BPF linker, which is a BPF object file linker uh, in LLVM because yeah, LLVM is used uh, under the hood and uh, also in AYA, the library itself. And uh, if you have to, if one day you need to write eBPF, just know that you will have to fight a lot with the, the code verifier uh, because it, he is very, very picky and you clearly need to uh, understand what you are doing, otherwise it's going to, to ring uh, everywhere. So yeah, conclusion, developing eBPF is not easy. So uh, future of this project, uh, I will not sing that song because I'm pretty bad at singing. Um, but yeah, there is still a lot to do on this project. I already invested a lot of time. Um, and uh, yeah, basically the future of all this will depend on whether I can uh, some some kind of found this project. So a lot of ideas, uh, a lot of maintenance to do as well, and some of uh, R&D to do, so developing new probes. I would like to try to run this on phones. I'm pretty sure it works. Uh, maybe the idea of building phony pots uh, would be nice. So a bit of, of advertisement. Uh, I will do some advertisement for Aya, which is a nice library. Uh, so uh, the people there in this project are really good, really nice, uh, really skilled. And you should definitely take a look at it if you want to uh, write eBPF and, uh, yeah, write eBPF basically. The only drawback is that you will have to do it in Rust, but that's very, very powerful library. And finally, advertisement for Kunai. So I know that sometimes some corporation institution don't really like to use free products. So there is no problem for that. Uh, I can provide you some services. So thank you all. Thank you uh, to the SQL guys. Uh, thank you, of course, to all the guys behind uh, the great AYA project. And uh, you can reach me out on different different platform, uh, and these are the the reference uh, you can look at if you want to go deeper. And time for uh, question and comments. We have time for a couple of questions. Anyone? Oops. I, um, could you elaborate a little bit on the um, uh, possibility to run it on phones uh, and, and how would you see that on Apple devices, if at all? Ah, uh, the problem is that uh, I, I don't think Apple uh, actually implemented this whole uh, eBPF uh, thing on uh, on their kernel. Uh, I know that uh, Microsoft wants to do it inside uh, Windows kernel, but uh, I think it's really, really, uh, um, let's say, um, basic for the moment, and we can do maybe 10% of what we can do on Linux. But I think it can work on Android devices. Yeah, first of all, thanks for your presentation. And I also uh, know how much we did suffer uh, on eBPF because I did uh, add the support of eBPF to Suricata and I know it was painful. <laughs> so, but my question is, what kernel do you support? Uh, for, for the, uh, 
Uh, did you finish? Yeah, what kernel do you support? In fact, on if you manage to also support multiple kernels. Yeah, uh, actually, I uh, support all the LTS kernel. That was my goal in the beginning. So I support from 5.4 until 6.1 with a single binary. Uh, and this is achieved through the core, uh, so it's BPF core is compiled once, run everywhere. Uh, this is a feature of uh, eBPF, and that's uh, that's how I do it. And uh, what is nice as well is that all the kernels are constantly checking, co constantly checked uh, inside the CI/CD pipeline. So every time there is an update, I run the tests on the on the kernel. So I'm sure it's uh, always running on all all those kernels. Okay. If there are no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you.